Thank you all for joining our virtual Armory Live discussion today, Public Art, The Way Forward. Some housekeeping first. Um, we have disabled the chat function. So if you have a question, please use the Q&A function. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can after the talk. I apologize in advance if we don't get to your question, but we'll try to get to as many as possible. The Armory Show has partnered with both Times Square Arts and For Freedoms on past projects. And when I read about their latest collaboration, it got me thinking about the role of public art, both during the pandemic and now in this time of protests. I wanted to provide an opportunity for the organization to tell us more about messages for the city and to bring along some artists who participated. I think we have a lot to learn from these ladies. I'd like to welcome our esteemed panelists, Jean Cooney, Michelle Wu, Nikisha Durrett, and Christine Wong Yap. Thank you all for being here. Let me give you a little bit of information if you're unfamiliar with who these fa fantastic women are. Jean Cooney is the director of Times Square Arts, which presents works by contemporary artists throughout the plazas, vacant spaces, and digital billboards of Times Square. Prior to her role there, Jean was deputy director for Creative Time, where she worked on many of the organization's large scale public artworks, including Kara Walker's A Subtlety and Duke Riley's Fly by Night and had the opportunity to stage projects across many space, spaces of the city, from Central Park, Grand Central Terminal, and Greenwood Cemetery, to the Brooklyn's Navy Yard and Army Terminal. Michelle Wu is a cultural producer, art historian, and arts business consultant based in Los Angeles. She is also a collaborating artist of Four Freedoms, for which she received a 2017 ICP Infinity Award. Her diverse role includes creative strategy, production, and project management of large-scale public art, exhibitions and programming, and curatorial advisement. Nikisha Durrett earned her BFA at the Cooper Union in New York City and MFA from the University of Michigan School of Art and Design. Durrett lives and works in Washington, D.C., where she creates large-scale public art, installations and drawings resulting from her long longtime interest in the graphic style of comics and advertising. Durrett's work seeks to manifest presence through arresting imagery and scale while bringing to the fore figuration and language that is often underrepresented or overlooked in visual culture. Christine Wong Yap is a project-based artist who often uses printmaking, drawing, and social practice to explore psychological well-being. She has participated in over a dozen residencies and studio programs. A longtime resident of the San Francisco Bay Area, she has lived and worked in Queens, New York since 2010. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with Messages for the City, um, before both the organizations speak about it and the artists, we're just going to quickly go through those images just so you have a sense of what we're talking about. And then Nikisha and Michelle, I'm mean, sorry, Nikisha and Christine will, um, will talk about their specific projects as we put up those images. So if we could have the images of the project for So these are on the billboards in Times Square. And we'll learn more about how many and if you haven't seen them. Pretty, pretty amazing. So Jean and Michelle, how did the Messages for the City Project come to be? And what do you see as the most powerful or salient thing about this particular project for both of your organizations? And we can take, take the images down for now. We'll come back to those when Nikisha and Christine speak. Thanks. Michelle, you want me to kick that off? OK. Um, well, Nicole, thanks for inviting us all here today to get a chance to talk to each other You know, as we plan this project remotely. I don't think we've really had enough chances to do that. So thank you. And thanks for you know just amplifying this campaign. And thanks to everyone that I can't see for joining us today. Um, but yeah, in short, it's, you know, this campaign came out of um, just a group of people sharing the same sense of urgency to respond to the unfolding pandemic in some way. So it ended up being a collaboration between Times Square Arts, Poster House, Print Magazine, For Freedoms, and um, it represents work from um, 12 visual artists and then over two dozen graphic designers. Um, and when we started, you know, back in March talking about um, how best to respond to the unfolding crisis that was 
the coronavirus um, in Times Square, you know, and what could we do with the resources we had? Um, we realized that even back in early March, images of an empty Times Square were flooding the media as shorthand for how severely public life in our city was shifting. Um, and so, you know, while the majority of us were sheltering at home, um, we also knew that Times Square wasn't actually empty. You know, even as the pandemic was spiking, there was about 30,000 people coming through Times Square every day. Normally, like around that time of year, it would have been something upwards of 300,000. So yes, by all measures, it was much more quiet, but there were hundreds of thousands of people in our city still going to their jobs that were now deemed essential. And so we figured if we were gonna create any public gesture, it needed to be in solidarity and in gratitude for those New Yorkers first and foremost. Um, and so one of the loudest and most visible platforms that we have to get out any message quickly and remotely are in Times Square, our digital billboards. And so after that, it was just, you know, a series of fast collaborations because we weren't alone in this impulse. A lot of people, you know, artists were creating work themselves that was ending up in break rooms of hospitals. Um, Poster House and Print Magazine had already been rallying designers to create public service announcements. Um, and they had secured the Link NYC kiosks, the digital spaces that you see across all five boroughs to display those public service announcements. We started talking to screen operators who also felt the sense of urgency to respond and communicate in some way. Um, and then I, you know, immediately turned to Four Freedoms because they just have a really unique um, history of you know, leveraging our public spaces, and in some cases, our traditional advertising spaces like we have in Times Square, for civic engagement and meaningful engagement. And they represent such an incredible network of artists that I thought could be really wonderful to include in this campaign. Michelle, does that kind of cover it? <laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, it's great to be here today. Um, yeah, I mean, I, Jean pretty much said it all, um, so I don't want to repeat <laughs> what she said, but, you know, we've been wanting to collaborate with Times Square for some time, and I think it actually started at a barbecue at Duke Riley Studio last year, yeah. and we just kept bumping into each other, and, you know, it's, it's um, unfortunate that, you know, the situation is what sort of precipitated our eventual collaboration, but you know, they've been extremely supportive of, you know, our mission to um, elevate the voices of artists in civil society. And we were just looking for ways to support um, artists because it, it really does take vulnerability and risk to be an artist, especially in a time when, you know, our livelihoods and our safety are at risk. Um, and, and certainly more so depending on um, uh, your own personal background. And so, you know, at a time of crisis of, uh, of the conscience, of the heart of society and politics, um, we felt that artists' voices needed to be sort of centered in, in this public discussion around the pandemic and um, the recent protests. Great. Well, thank you guys for, for organizing it and thanks to all the artists. How many artists are involved in, in the project? So, you know, if you're making the distinction between visual artist and designer, that might not be as important to some. I would, um, Times Square Arts and Four Freedoms rallied 12 artists. Um, so Paula Crown, you have Nikisha and Christine here, um, Alexa Garcia, Mel Chin formed a new collective under the title Gong, Jenny Holzer, Christine Sun Kim, Carrie Mae Weems. I mean, I, the list goes on and on. There's really fantastic artists involved and then, um, you know, even more fantastic designers. Um, Great. I don't, I don't think I should name all 24, but no, really people can go to the website and see. Yeah, yeah, get get more, I can get more yeah. information. Well, yeah. I'd love to hear more about the specific works that were created. Um, Nikisha, if you could tell us a little bit and if we could get the image images up of Nikisha's project. And Nikisha, go ahead and, and tell us a little bit while we're pulling that up. Sure. Um, that's Christine's, we'll get back to that. <laughs> okay. Great. So um, this opportunity um, to create this work came along at just the right time. Um, 
for me personally, because I was um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I was really struggling. I'm an educator um, and I couldn't teach my classes in person. Um, I, as an artist, I couldn't go um, to my studio. Um, and like so many people, um, I was at home um, just kind of like settling into um, stillness and um, what turned into a very uh, reflective period for me. And um, I was just kind of absorbing a lot of information, which kind of, um, which was helping me kind of contextualize um, what all was happening. Um, and during that time, um, I was following the work of um, Aijin Pu. Um, and um, right around that time, um, I received an invitation to submit a proposal for this work. And um, so much of the information that I was absorbing, um, I was going to be able to kind of funnel into um, funnel into this project and put into visual form um, everything that I had been um, processing. Um, so one of the first things that I did was kind of just look at a lot of images of, um, of Times Square um, and um, you know, obviously Times Square is flooded with uh, marketing imagery and um, theatrical billboards. Um, and so um, I- Sorry, kinda, Nikisha, I'm gonna stop you for one second. Yeah. If we can stop sharing the screen, I've had a question if people wanna make sure that they can see you speaking about. Oh, so okay. now we've had a good, time, a good amount of time looking at it. <laughs> we wanna see you. <laughs> My face. And my cat's gone now. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, so I was thinking about this space, and um, one of the things that I um, that I like to do with my work is to have it appear um, one way at first glance, and then um, when there's a um, there's like a, a second reading of the work, and you start to see something else. Um, so I wanted to kind of use the um, the strong um, graphic advertising aesthetic that's in that's in the vicinity um, and layer right on top of that um, this empathetic message um, so I think so empathy was kind of at the forefront of of um, developing the the idea um, I think that um, I mean, it's right in the definition of empathy is basically to, to see someone. Um, and I was seeing that there were populations of people who weren't included in this discussion of um, essential, essential workers and um, frontline workers. Um, and um, essential workers kind of, they exist. Um, many of them are, you know, at this intersection between um, gender and race, um, and 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 at that intersection, they're often invisible um, to begin with. Um, and so, I wanted to make a direct message um, to those people. At least, I had them in mind when I was creating the work. Amazing, great. And then, if we could get the images of Christine. Christine had three um, different scenes that she created. So we'll put those back up. We'll put those up. All right. Um, actually, I just thought it was so fascinating that Nikisha mentioned Ai Jin Pu. Um, for those of you who don't know, Ai Jin Pu is an organizer with the domestic, National Domestic Workers Alliance, which organizes um, home care workers or um, people who work in the home as domestic workers. And so many of those workers are women of color and immigrant women. So I was really um, glad to learn about that from Nikisha because that adds a lot to like who we're talking about when we talk about essential workers. Um, for me, I really wanted to focus on real New York City medical workers. 
um, and um, I created three images just because, you know, medical workers are so diverse, especially in New York City. This first one is thank you for your courage um, and it features three workers from Jacoby Medical Center, which is like um, part of the public health system here in New York, which is actually like the largest public health system in um, all of the United States. Uh, and the woman in the middle is Kelly Cabrera. She's actually a union activist with the New York State Nurses Association. And she's been super vocal, um, appearing in the media, speaking out for proper PPE or um, personal protective equipment. Uh, I think especially towards the beginning of the pandemic, the easiest thing artists could do and any kind of crafters or sewers could do is start sewing masks, which is like an effort I helped to um, do. Um, and it was just a way to show solidarity with medical workers because the more cloth mask that every person uses and washes and reuses is a one more mask in the supply chain for medical workers. Um, the Another image that I made is thank you for your commitment. This is the one that's been up um, on billboards in the past couple of weeks. Um, I made this based on um, two real FDNY paramedics, Sherry Singleton and Crystal Cadet. Um, this has been a really powerful experience for me because through the process of um, learning about them, through how they've spoken out in media and online, and also getting to know them um, through this process, um, I've, I've learned quite a lot um, about them and it's been a really rewarding experience. So I'm just gonna disclose a little bit of their health information, but it's nothing that isn't already online. Um, they both actually contracted COVID um, in the line of duty. And Crystal got it first, and then Sherry as a good friend, you know, does what so many of us have to do when our healthcare um, system is inadequate for covering all the costs of um, critical illness. And she started a GoFundMe. And then as Sherry was managing that GoFundMe for her friend, she also contracted COVID. Luckily, they're both home and recovering. Um, um, just last week, Sherry was able to um, get um, the go ahead to return to work. And just like knowing that these two super young, super strong women can be like, um, affected so severely really adds to the gravity of like, you know, it's not just the flu. Um, this is a real serious illness. And um, also just like knowing that despite all this, they see themselves as public servants who run towards situations where other people are running away. Um, that's very powerful too. Sherry actually told me that it's always been a dream of hers to represent FDNY on a billboard. Um, so that was one of the most amazing things I've ever heard as an artist. So I'm very humbled and grateful for this opportunity. Okay, the third image is thank you for your sacrifice. Um, you know, I am Asian American. I think especially as COVID began and we started hearing about incidents of anti-Asian um, sentiment and personal attacks in the media as well as from friends and loved ones. That was um, deeply affecting for me. I think um, for me, it was important to make sure to represent um, how Asian Americans are also fighting and suffering from this virus just as everybody else. And um, this is actually an emergency room doctor in Queens. And um, I also wanted to recognize not just medical workers, but um, their families as well because they are also the ones who are making deep sacrifices during this time. Um, as you can imagine like what an emergency room doctor might go through working like 13, 14 hour shifts, um, just struggling to understand and grapple with this like disease and then not being able to go home and hug their kids and maybe even having to move out of their home if they have people who are immunocompromised or babies or older people living at their home. And, and just thinking about that for weeks on end. So really just honoring all these like um, sacrifices, commitment and, and service um, of these medical workers was uh, a huge honor for me. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you both for sharing, sharing your experience um, in creating for this project. We're gonna broaden up uh, the, the topic now and just say, 
my question is, what is the purpose of public art from each of your perspectives, organizationally, individually, um, and has that changed due to the pandemic or now in response to the protests uh, regarding racial injustice? So feel free to jump in and this can be more of a discussion. It doesn't have to be each person responding, but whoever wants to address that. Um, one of the things that, um, that drew me to um, creating uh, public works was just sort of a frustration that I would see in one showing my work in galleries um, and also going to galleries as a visitor and not seeing people who look like me. Um, and I felt that, you know, there is, you know, there was something about these, these spaces that um, intimidated people um, and made them feel like they um, didn't belong or that they weren't welcome. Um, and so um, I started seeking out opportunities to display my work in public places so that um, the work kind of belonged to everyone and that the um, in trying to like bury like um, multiple meanings in my work so that they kind of exist there for the public to um, to mine and explore. Um, I think public art is um, an opportunity to um, engage people in discourse that they typically feel um, excluded from. Uh, I think that uh, I, I would totally agree with that. I think um, public art is really interesting because it's inherently cross sector. And I think um, for artists, it's really interesting as a way to bypass art world gatekeepers and connect with more diverse and democratic audiences. Um, I think it's a really interesting moment right now to be talking about public art because a lot of people often, when they first think about public art, they think about bronze monuments. And so many of those monuments are coming down. And um, some people think of those monuments as history. And um, I choose to think of them as a way that people choose to write or rewrite history, testing certain people as victors. Um, I think um, I think another way thing that people think of when they think of public art is community murals. And in contrast, like what you're seeing in places like downtown Oakland, California, with all the murals uh, kind of just springing up on boarded up storefronts during this people's uprising is super inspiring. Um, and the way you're seeing like people's anger and grief their calls to action, as well as like what artists do best is like their transformative visions for society is um, really interesting. Yeah. And Michelle, I mean, that's your organization is based on that, right? Your organization is, is giving a platform for artists to, to share some of this knowledge to try and change systemic injustice. Yeah, I mean, artists are, you know, I think they've always done this, is, is critique and challenge and make um, for the long term. I mean, I think there is certainly aspects of art that, that address the current moment or that um, respond to, you know, some of the more immediate things happening. But I, I think it's, it, it's, it's always about projecting out and, and kind of imagining um, the world we actually want to live in. And that's by talking about things um, in a non-objective way, because we know that perspective is, is what the human experience is about and it's, it's what art is about as well. Um, I think from the Four Freedoms Front, um, public art, well, most of, most of what we do is, is for the public. And uh, we've really prioritized uh, centering artists' voices in the public discourse. And I think that's important because of the artist's unique ability to imagine and to, to harness creativity. I think there is creativity in all of us, but I think there, there is the unique capacity of the artist to to really cultivate that and translate that into um, possibilities. Um, 
and I think in a moment right now, um, it's particularly important because we need to center uh, human-based values and a shared sense of collective responsibility um, about the kind of world we want to live in and how we want to change it. And I think, um, you know, artists aren't in the business of having re reductive, um, oversimplified or polarizing conversations. We're about digging deeper and, and, and listening to each other and, and um, being in that vulnerable space to um, create and think big. Jean? I mean, I think Nikisha, Christine, and Michelle said that so beautifully. Um, I think, you know, yes, it's about a direct exchange between the artist and the public in a more democratic and accessible way. Um, but I really, I would just add that I really appreciate what Nikisha was saying about, you know, having multiple points of access and understanding for a public artwork, I think is really important. I mean, public art can absolutely be beautiful and it can have an art historical context, but it just, it has to have relevance to our everyday lives and that meaning shouldn't be too obscured. Um, you know, beneath too many layers. Um, you know, at Creative Time, we were always, you know, I was trained there to work with artists who were trying to address, you know, pressing social, cultural, political issues, but then moving to a Times Square, that perspective was even further refined because, you know, when you're presenting public artwork in such a highly public place, you just can't make any assumptions on, you know, where people are coming from. Um, and there's, thousands of people there that aren't necessarily seeking an art experience. So you can't even make that assumption. Um, and so I think, you know, in that sense, it's about working with artists who can have those multiple access points of, of understanding within their artwork, but it's also on the, the presenting organization to make sure that you're actively engaging people and not just, you know, putting an artwork out in public space and kind of just walking away and leaving it there. Um, and, um, yeah, more, doing more active engagement around that work is, is, I think, the purpose of having our work out there in those public spaces. And, and do you think that this is a real opportunity? I mean, the fact that New York hasn't opened back up, um, public art is out there. You've had this project going. Um, is this something that we can hopefully see more of in the future or that more people might be able to have access to um, or be in, engaged with um, if they're not able to go to museums for a while or they aren't able to go to galleries, um, you know, are, and, and it, like you said, Christine, it could be murals on the, on the boarded up buildings. Um, do you see this as, as a, an interesting time that there could be a shift towards public art or no, it, that's probably not gonna happen. What do you think? I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nikisha, you go. Um, I think it's a good, a good opportunity for people to, who didn't already know to recognize um, the power that can be unleashed with pu public art. Um, a good, um, an, an example of that would be um, the mural that, that um, popped up overnight here in DC, um, the Black Lives Matter mural um, in now Black Lives Matter Plaza in front of the White House. Um, there is um, an example there of, it's, it's, it's such a difficult thing to talk about, um, where our mayor kind of driven by her bravado, um, commissioned this, this artwork and co-opted messaging from people who are doing a lot of the difficult work of um, challenging anti-Blackness and um, creating messaging around defunding the police. Um, she co-opted that language um, and in, in, in doing that, on the one hand, she 
inspired other cities to kind of do the same thing. Um, but on the other hand, like she kind of missed, um, missed the mark on um, putting policy and action behind um, what she was doing. So it's, it has to function, like you just can't inspire people, like it can't just be something that lives on Instagram. It has to be something that actually has muscle behind it. And, um, you know, I mean, it, that was the, the clap back heard around the world and I appreciate that but it's, it also has to be followed up with, um, with action. Um, it's, there, I can't tell you how many messages I saw on social media that were like, uh, um, Muriel Bowser's got my vote. Like, she, you know, uh, I, I'll, you know, I'm gonna vote for her now. Um, so it, it could possibly be public art that gets her reelected as mayor. Um, so, Public art is really, um, can be really powerful when used correctly, but it can also be dangerous when it's not because people can just kind of celebrate this moment, settle into that moment of seeing that, you know, kind of satisfying, like I said, clap back and then nothing comes out of it. Do you, and Christine, this is to you and Christine, do you feel more responsibility when you're creating public art to have a certain message? So Nikisha, when I was learning more about your art practice, you created a mural for a library and they asked you to change the gender of one of, one of the figures. Yeah. And that was, that must, I mean, it seemed like that was a difficult thing. So do you ever feel like, I mean, there's, there's a responsibility when you create a public art, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So do you feel that you have to compromise things sometimes with your message? Is that part of it? Or do you feel a freedom? That, as is, an artist? that is a challenge for sure. And I'll, I'll let um, Christine, if you wanted to talk about that. Um, I, I, yeah, definitely. That is, that is a challenge. Um, sometimes your message can get diluted. For sure. Yeah, I think um, the responsibility I feel is not necessarily to have a certain message most of the time, hopefully, ideally. Um, and um, the responsibility is more to be an ethical and diligent partner working with the community. Um, I think there is less freedom of expression, but that's okay because it's not always about you and that's what studio practice is for. Um, I think, um, you know, like in the same way that as an artist, I really value creative freedom as an individual, like you can take that, um, you know, like as an, as individuals who value liberty, like, you know, maybe not wearing a mask in the middle of a pandemic is not a good idea because um, life is not just about doing what you want when you want, there's more to it. And um, there are gifts to be gained from being in a relationship with other people and relationships are only nurtured by listening and a sense of mutuality and generosity and understanding and sharing. And I would say for me, like, you know, sometimes there are a lot of hurdles for sure in public art, but it's also like the trade-off is like to be able to skip those art world gatekeepers and to access a much bigger and more diverse audience than otherwise you might have access to. And, and so you, a lot of what your work, at least that I've um, been exposed to, Christine, is, is involving the community, like, it, like really involving them, surveys and questionnaires and things like that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about, obviously that's an important element for you. Why did it become that? Has it always been a part of your practice? Um, I think mean, over the past 10 years, I realized, like, I want to make art that's not about me. And so I've been, like, making art that's more participatory and more um, socially engaged. And um, recently, I've been working on an exhibition with the John Michael Kohler Art Center in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, and had the opportunity to be interviewed by a bunch of middle school uh, young curators. <laughs> and um, some of their questions were really, it was really great experience to, like, talk about my work in not the usual like art school terms, but in much more simple terms. And um, I think 
uh, one of the things I was thinking about was like, oh, it really comes down to my values. Like, uh, I think their question was like, how does your identity get influenced your art? And I was like, oh, who I am shapes my values. As like a woman of color, I am more interested in creating more equitable and inclusive and accessible um, platforms through my work. Um, and that's uh, a way that my, my values and who I am connect to what I do, it, giving what I do more than, it gives what I do as an artist uh, more meaning and purpose and um, connection for me than if I was just uh, making art that satisfied something um, in myself, I think. Great. And Akisha, in, in a video I watched, you said, when change is happening around us, one of the things we feel is powerlessness. Obviously, we've had a lot of change recently. How can that art help us grapple with that? How can your art, I guess, um, help us feel it, grapple with that feeling of powerlessness? Mm. I mean, I, I think that me as, a, as an artist and as a, as a, um, as a creator, that definitely, it definitely helps me to not, um, to not feel so powerless. And I was kind of like, just kind of sinking into that um, early on, early on in the pandemic. And, and also um, with the recent um, protests and, um, and just trying to, in, in finding my, finding the, finding my voice and the way that I want to kind of put out into the world um, what I'm seeing and um, what I'm feeling. And there's just, there's, there's a hope that, um, that what I'm doing can possibly, um, change hearts or inspire people to action. Um, I think that that's one of the, one of the powers that we have as, as artists and as creative people um, is that, um, you know, historically, like laws can change, but if hearts don't change, then, then we're kind of where we are right now. Um, and I think that, um, artists historically have, have, have tried to do that, have tried to, um, tried to change hearts and minds. Because as Michelle said, you know, we, and this is something that I try to instill in my students as an educator, um, you know, their imagination, our imagination is the most, um, is the sharpest tool in our, in our toolbox. And along the way, many of us lose that many of us who hold on to that do become artists and we are able to to kind of dream it big and imagine different possibilities well i want to um ask both of you to share with us projects that you might be working on right now so um why don't we start with Christine? Are there particular projects that you're working on right now that you can tell us a little bit about? Oh, yeah, I'm a lead artist in the project called Art, Culture, and Belonging in partnership with the Chinese Culture Center of San Francisco and um, the Chinatown um, Arts and Culture Coalition. And what we're trying to do is just engage people around how art and culture impact their sense of belonging in San Francisco Chinatown. And I think belonging for me is a lens to which, um, through which you can see a lot of different issues. I think, especially right now, thinking about Black Lives and the question of belonging, if someone belongs in a space just driving, in a public space just running, in, in any um, place like on Lake Merritt barbecuing, I think all those questions are super interconnected. And I think this question of public art is really about public space and who has the right to belong and whose stories get to belong. Um, so that's ongoing. And it's been really nice to also partner with 100 Days Action, which is in an, a collective of artists who have been um, 
approaching small business owners who have boarded at storefronts in the Bay Area and then offering artwork with messages of gratitude, very similar to the Times Square and Four Freedoms project. Um, and then they actually like wheat paste um, those images on there for free to the business owners. And I think, um, you know, it is geared, geared towards essential workers and just recognizing that like, um, you know, so many people, especially in Chinatown, are working at restaurants, and those restaurants have been hit really hard. You know, um, medical workers, home care workers are really cross-sector in such a lot of different um, communities. Um, so, yeah, it's been, um, I mean, yeah, I have a lot of feelings. So, thank you. Great. <laughs> <That's asking. laughs> okay. And Nikisha, we, I think we have a couple images of uh, recent projects, if we can put those those images up and you can tell us a bit about. Um, yeah, so um, this project is actually from uh, a couple summers ago. Um, it was for the um, By the People um, Festival. Um, and this was the inaugural um, art festival. Um, and I was asked to create a work on the lawn of, well, actually not on the lawn. I was asked to create work on the property of the, um, the historic Walter Reed building um, or campus. Um, and so initially I was asked to paint these, uh, these purple, um, paint these sidewalks. Um, and so, uh, yes, yeah, so you can see a little bit of the sidewalk there. Um, and um, I painted the sidewalks purple and put uh, text on the sidewalks that said, um, heaven lasts forever. Um, in the, in the, um, the green, um, I put um, this text that says, yes, Laud, which is um, text that I've kind of, uh, language that I've heard my entire life from the matriarchs in my family. Um, and, uh, I, it's, it's language that I, that I never, that I never see like, um, foregrounded in, in like, in, in mainstream discourse. And I, um, I thought, wow, how amazing would it be to put that, um, on this green? Um, and, um, it also is language that I've heard in a, there's in a James Baldwin, uh, a James Baldwin speech where he's talking about identity um, and kind of being, um, he had this great visual where he describes like um, having a conversation with his mother as a young boy and telling her like what he wants to do with his life and who he wants to be. And his mom is like telling him the facts of life, which, you know, for, certain people, the facts of life are one thing um, for black men and women. Um, it's, it's, diff it's very different. And what she told him was that, um, you know, in life, you're gonna wanna do this and do that, um, but you're gonna be met, basically you're gonna be met with opposition because there are people who are not gonna believe that you have the right to do those things or that you have the capacity um, to do those things. Um, so yeah, um, so this was really, and there's also a bit of a personal element in this for me. My sister was actually born at Walter Reed, um, hospital. My dad was in the military. Um, and, um, and, and my dad is obsessed with grooming the lawn. Um, so I, so it's kind of a tribute to him as well. Can we go to the next image, please? Super. Um, so this is a, um, a project that I'm working on um, right now and it's going to be an ongoing project. Um, I um, was invited by Deborah Willis to be a part of her um, 100 Years, 100 Women exhibition. Um, and it's 100 um, women artists um, addressing um, the 100th anniversary of the, um, of the 19th Amendment. Um, and um, this is a project that uh, I had to, that had to evolve. The situation with the pandemic um, 
put me in a position where I had to completely change the way I was going to execute this project and in doing that and also um, um, the um, social and racial unrest um, completely um, I was just inspired to completely change the direction of the work. Um, not having access to um, my studio and not having access to, um, to woodworkers and craft, crafts people could, who could help me make the project in its original scope, um, I had to figure out a way to, um, to create this work um, in a smaller space, which would be um, here, right here at my dining room table in my kitchen. Um, so, um, at the start of the pandemic, I was taking walks um, in um, the local cemetery, um, my neighborhood cemetery, um, and um, there are huge magnolia trees there, and I'm always marveling at the, the, um, the leaves, the coloration, and um, the texture of the leaves, and I had always wanted to um, do something with, like, uh, um, perforating the leaves with some sort of, with text or um, some sort of imagery, but I wasn't sure what. Um, and so when I was revisiting this project, you know, spending so much time in the park and um, um, there were more black women and men being killed. Um, I, again, as a person who is, um, creating work that is shown in public places or even in, and also in gallery spaces, I'm always looking to see who isn't a part of the situation, who isn't a part of the discussion and how, um, what I can inject into the discussion. Um, and so um, I was greatly inspired by the Say Your Name movement and, and um, decided that I was going to, um, perforate the names of Black women who have been killed at the hands of police into these leaves. Um, how, how many leaves do you have so far? Um, so far, I have um, 22. Um, so I'm, I'm able to make about two a day. Um, and I'm also making a short film um, related to the project. Um, and um, hopefully in January, I'll be having a solo exhibition here, um, down here in the DC area. And I, by then, I, you know, the, unfortunately, the quantity of leaves um, would have grown um, greatly because there are, there are many. I've, I've so far, I've gone back to 1979 um, to present day. Um, so my hope is to put these in light boxes and exhibit them in um, the gallery space and um, have them illuminate the space so there'd be no other lighting but these light boxes. Well, thank you. Thank you both for sharing your current projects. Um, so that we can get to questions, I just have one last question for everybody. And I'm going to start with Michelle and then go to Jean, Christine, and Nikisha. How can we as an art community help to do more to promote public art and the artists who create it. Yeah, I, I actually think my collaborator, Eric, said it best. We were talking the other day and he said, you know, the more that we direct artists and the more that we try to um, use art in service of other agendas, um, is when it stops becoming, it's when it stops being art. And so I think the best thing that we can do is to let the artist lead, honestly. And it's, and it's something that we, we care a lot about and, and prioritize in our programming and um, uh, activations. Um, I think artists, you know, as I mentioned, encourage us to, um, think beyond the knowing objective mind. They connect us to one another and I think they help us to connect better with ourselves. Um, so yeah, let, let the artists lead. My collaborator Hank also says that all the time. <laughs> I think that's great. I would add just, you know, keep giving public platforms to artists 
who can communicate with our most vulnerable or amplify our most marginalized voices and, and artists who, you know, are especially gifted at synthesizing a whole host of complicated emotions and set of circumstances that we're feeling right now so that we can all feel them together. Um, and I would say, you know, institutions who are not necessarily traditionally presenting public programming, I just say now's the time to collaborate. And if we have open space, open it up and, and share it. And, you know, if your museum is closed in the spirit of public art, figure out which communities you need to travel to to get artwork to those communities right now, rather than thinking inside of your own four walls. Um, I think the Queens Museum is doing a great job of that. Sally Talent is doing an excellent shout out for Sally because she's involving the community and providing access to art at a time when she can't open the space. Exactly, yeah. and I would encourage even non-arts institutions to think that way too. I think, you know, artists, we all have to reimagine a way forward and that's, you know, other nonprofits or even our commercial spaces and our retail spaces and restaurants and, you know, Broadway theaters will be closed for a long time to come. It's just, we're all trying to think about the way forward um, through both this pandemic and also this political unrest around racial justice. And there's no reason why artists um, shouldn't be leading those conversations as well. So I would say, think about artists when you're trying to think of creative ways to go forward. Um, I have a couple things to say. One is I think every art opportunity is an opportunity for more diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think right now, the, those two questions of like, if not now, when, if not us, who, is, are so relevant. Um, I think um, I just want to say that I'm very grateful to Four Freedoms and Times Square Arts and the Armory Show for creating this opportunity. And I say that because the other artists and designers and messages for the city, there are some of them who are legends who I've looked up to for years um, and like decade or more. And uh, it's really um, it's really special for me to be included among them. And I also say that as someone who has seen the Armory show from the perspective of an art handler installing art. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I also wanted to say that, um, you know, there's a lot of amazing public art programming in New York City. I think sometimes it's easy for institutions to follow the lead of major galleries and institutions and just work with artists who are already validated by the market. Um, I think if institutions are serious about creating a more equitable art world, they need to pay artists. They need to not ask artists to work on spec ever. They need to not ask artists to work for free and they need to change the culture that undervalues artists' labor. And the artist shouldn't be asked to compete by submitting budgets where the stipend doesn't cover all of the labor, or it'll cover all of the materials and labor for everybody else. And maybe like 50% of the studio labor and like 30% of the admin labor. And I think when institutions partner with artists, um, it would be amazing if translation and accessibility were not afterthoughts and if they had strong, genuine relationships with communities that they could support artists to partner with um, through proper time, outreach, and accountability. Um, and then the last thing I'm just gonna say, I know I have a lot of things to say. No, it's good, I'm gonna um, hear it. That's yeah. why we're having this oh, talk. Cool, uh, so public, because public art is inherently cross-sector and it, and it cuts through so many spheres that encompasses social practice, community arts, crafts, Outsider art, um, there's just so many, so many resources, so much attention, scholarship, documentation, archiving, platform and support in the art world. There's no reason why so much of it should go towards like the top 5% of artists collected by the top 1% of people in the world. Great. Thank you. Nikisha. Thank you. Like you hit every, every single point. Um, that was amazing. Um, yeah, I, I agree with that your, to your last point. Um, you know, I wasn't even thinking about um, initially making public work. It was someone 
someone here in DC who, you know, was working for an arts organization who saw my work and said, you know, have you, and asked me, have you ever thought about doing public, public art? And, you know, over time, like we developed this relationship and I've learned a lot about um, working in public art from doing, um, doing these, these projects um, over time. Um, public art isn't something that one learns necessarily learns how to do in class and in, in art school like there isn't a public art course so it does take people just kind of like maybe seeing someone who has never done a public art project before but recognizing um, potential in their um, in their messaging and 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 recognizing that that's something that that needs to be um, that needs to be um, a part of the, the, the cultural landscape. Um, oftentimes, um, the people who are in those positions to make those, um, to make those kinds of choices um, are not people who look like me or Christine. Um, so it takes people also like looking around and their organization looking at their board and seeing who is not there, who is not represented and pulling those people in. Um, and um, yeah, I think every other point, yeah, I think, I think you guys hit every other point. Great, that's really helpful, I'm sure, for our audience. It's definitely helpful for me to hear as a, as a fair producer. And I well, wanna get to the one more thing, like an artist, you need to be centered, they need to be centered in in these conversations, you know, some, so, so often we come in like at the, the tail end of a, like a development project and they want to like pepper the development with, with art. Um, and like artists should be like sitting at the table with these people from the beginning. Yeah. Great point. Great point. So I want to get to a couple of questions here. Maybe we have time for two. Um, has funding adjusted up or down in the current situation, both for the organizations, how has the funding, how has it impacted funding and for your projects, um, artists? Does anybody want to tackle that one? Direct impact of lack of or increased funding? Um, I haven't really experienced decreased funding yet. Um, because I think a lot of the organizations kind of already have maybe, you know, they they have their budgets set, you know, like our DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities, there's a, there's a request for applications that's out right now. Um, there's definitely like, I feel like I've been busier now than I have been <laughs> in, uh, in a while. Um, yeah, I don't know, Christine. I think it's the same. It seems like organizations have their budget and allocations and we'll see what happens next year. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of organizations that I've been working with have been able to like pivot the mindset that like um, doing work online and virtually is also work and um, maybe money that was set aside for doing in-person engagement can be um, just directly fed to artists to support us during this time for the online work that we're doing. And how about organizationally? Are you guys seeing changes? I mean, yeah, we're we're looking at next year and we're trying to plan for multiple scenarios, one of which, you know, forecasts a lot less funding and revenue streams than we would typically see. Although in the last couple of weeks, even there's just been really radical new and innovative ways that funders are pulling together more money. So we'll see. We don't know what the future holds, but I know that for this year, as, as so many of our um, was a few major initiatives were put on pause because of the pandemic, we were able to divert, like Christine said, divert some of that funding towards artist fees and curatorial fees and, and technical fees for this type of more responsive programming. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we operate a little bit differently in that we're sort of budgeting on a campaign or, or major project basis. So I think part of what we're doing is um, uh, changing the way we are um, funding. So um, looking at multi-year uh, funding, um, particularly for 
operations and in human capital because um, you know, it's funny, a lot of funders want to fund programs, but they don't understand that there are real people who actually create and facil facilitate, excuse me, those programs. So I think when the pandemic hit, we definitely, um, you know, had to manage that we had a little bit of a crisis on our end um, because we had just wrapped a major project. Um, um, and that's just sort of how we always are. Uh, like I said, how we've, we've always kind of operated in the past, but in looking forward, um, there seems to be funding out there. Um, but, you know, the things that, that funders are wanting to fund is changing. And so we're just, you know, learning how to adapt to that to that language, um, while also making sure that you know our values and our priorities remain intact. So it's um, you know it's a process. It's a process, and um, we've we've always figured it out. So I I have confidence that we will continue to figure it out. Well, yes. I mean, the, a message here is clearly support arts organizations that are supporting artists and support artists as much as you can, um, so that these great public works, but also our practices continue. Um, there are a ton of other questions and I'm so sorry, but I just, I know how, how overwhelmed we are with screen time. So I want to end um, on time and thank you all for your, your questions. We could talk about this for hours and hours. Um, I, I encourage you to check out the Four Freedoms website, the Times Square Arts website, and Christine, what's your website? It's just my name.com, Christine Wong, yeah.com. And Nikisha. Uh, my name, Nikisha Durrett, N E K I S H A D U R R E T T. Um, Amazing. Com. Great. You guys are doing, all of you are doing tremendous work. Um, for Freedoms and, and Times Square Arts, it's, it was a pleasure to partner with you in the past. I hope we have a great future together. Thank you for introducing me to these two amazing artists. Uh, thank you again to all of our panelists, to all of you for joining us, and keep your eyes out for our next virtual Armory Live or virtual CLS discussion. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.